Ah, Vega de Neb and Altair, such bright stars and what stories they have to tell. And we're glad that you're here to hear them on Stay Curious Today, Stay Star Curious. I'm Stargazer Mark, and we're so glad that you joined us here at the American Space Museum as we're going to do a little astronomy on this Monday, September 19th. We've been having so many guests on Stay Curious, so we're grateful for that. We've gotten a little bit away from once a month talking about what's in your backyard that you can see in all three of these stars that are on my green screen behind here. You can see directly overhead as it gets dark. Altair, Deneb, and Vega over here. To my, and uh, we're going to talk about the Summer Triangle, they're called. But summer is ending on September 22nd, just a few days away. And though they're called the Summer Triangle, you're going to see this triangle of three stars well into November. In fact, the, the months of October uh, in late September is when it really looks great. So I want to say hello to Marty Winkle, my co-producer and cameraman, and running the Streamlabs operation there. Hi, Marty. How are you? Doing good, Mark. How are you? Well, we're glad to have all of our friends here today and glad to hear you on the microphone that the UCAC brothers bought us in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Thank you guys for support and stay curious. Our proud nonprofit, the American Space Museum, is always willing to take your tax deductible donation to our humble museum. And with it, we try to do uh, safe space history and reach out with program like Stay Curious. And we have an education program uh, for kids that is starting to take off big. So, uh, but Marty's had a good weekend and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, these three stars. It's going to, they all look about the same brightness in the sky. Vega off my shoulder is, is the brightest of the three. And, uh, but like people, stars are all different. They're different shapes and sizes and, and uh, brightnesses, if you will. Some people smile, some don't. So you can relate that to stars. Uh, but stars, every star has a story to tell and, and is different. And though we're looking at the three main stars we're going to talk about, all these stars behind them are in our Milky Way and, and have a size, a distance in a temperature that is individual to just them. And you'll understand that a little bit more. Here's my night sky guide. This is called a planisphere. You see this is set to today's date. And right there, that dark band in the middle of my planisphere, as I move it, is the Milky Way. So at 9 o'clock tonight, the Milky Way is directly overhead. And it is so gorgeous as it starts flopping over to the western horizon. Uh, the net and, and particularly in a time when the moon is between last quarter and the uh, new phase, that is when the moon is in the after midnight sky, and the moonshine will not drown out the, the faint stars of the Milky Way. So that's why this is a great week to get out, a good weekend if you're a camper to see the Milky Way, and then we'll rotate in October a month from now will be a great time to see the Milky Way. But you are always going to see these three stars from your backyard, Altar, Deneb, and Vega. And I'm going to blow your mind with a little star curious facts about these three stars. and Because uh, they are time machines as well as uh, uh, intense brightness depending on how far away they are. So, Marty, but we do want to talk about quickly one... Uh, we want to thank the Hyatt Place Studios for sponsoring Stay Curious uh, this next uh, couple weeks as we're having an event called The Base to Space. This Sunday from 2 to 4, film producers Mike Cotton uh, and his partner are putting on the documentary about the mobile launch platform number 2. And let me get reach over here to grab my PR sheet there. Uh, this is the fifth documentary by Mike Cotton and David Barnes. Worked over on 100 projects, and they have been filming and filmed the destruction or demolition of the mobile launch platform that was lifted up by the NASA crawler and taken out to pad 39A or B, either with the Apollo Saturn V on it or a Skylab Saturn S1B. 
uh, and lots of space shuttles launched off this historic platform. Uh, innocuous in form, but big in history is MLB2 Mobile Launch Platform 2. Come and, and the meet and greet at 2 o'clock. The movie will be at 3. Uh, this uh, is a $25 in advance and $30 at the door. Go to the American Space Museum event page and you can get your ticket there. It's also on our thread up there. And uh, we're grateful that uh, producer Pete uh, Charamont and both Mike Cotton and Dave Barnes are turning over 100% of the proceeds to the American Space Museum. We have a limit of 100 seats at $25 a seat, $30 at the door. Thank you if we can raise over $2,000 for our humble museum for this weekend event. And you get to meet astronaut Bruce Melnick, who is featured on the show, uh, the documentary, The Base to Space, and Bruce Melnick will be there uh, and uh, for, for uh, to talk about this uh, wonderful, wonderful documentary. Yes, Marty, got a question already. Yeah, Dave Stang is asking, do we reach our magic number of followers? Well, Dave, thank you for asking, Dave Stangy. We're looking for 10,000 followers on Facebook. The last time I looked, it was 10,000, I mean, it was 9,995. So we have no is the answer. We've not reached that. So create a page, Dave, for your pet uh, and uh, like, uh, like us on there. Now, we want legitimate uh, people on there, but we only picked up a couple over the weekend, but we're trying and... And uh, hey, you know, it's important to us to monetize Facebook. We've monetized YouTube and uh, we'll, we'll reach it, but we haven't reached it yet. Thanks for asking, Dave Stangy. And he's a happy uh, uh, Wolverine up there. His football team won big and, and my Buckeyes, uh, they won pretty good, but not as big as his Wolverines did, shutting out their opponent, I think, 49 to nothing. But we're not here to talk sports. We're here to talk space. So we'll see you at the Base to Space Sunday. I'll be there. Uh, and uh, so be happy to see all of you there. $25 in advance, 30 at the door. And uh, this is a worthy cause, of course, the American Space Museum, but a wonderful documentary about this platform and all of the important missions that were launched off of it. Marty, we do have an astronaut birthday real quick. Quick, The first veterinarian to go to space, Richard Linehan, is 65 years old today. Welcome to the golden senior years, Richard. He was born in uh, on this date, uh, September 19th, in Lowell, Massachusetts, but he was raised in New Hampshire, Hudson, and Pelham, New Hampshire, by his uh, paternal grandparents, Henry and May Linehan. And... Uh, he received his veterinary degree at the Ohio State University, go Buckeyes, and then he got a degree in public administration from Harvard, uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a public speaker. Not a whole lot about him. Four shuttle missions, though. Uh, Linehan was on the, um, there he is in older years, he was on the uh, uh, the microgravity lab, the space lab. He was an EVA walker on STS-109, Hubble telescope. And then his last mission, uh, he was on Endeavor for uh, a hard hat mission. And he did three spacewalks uh, on there. So a very experienced spacewalker, uh, Richard Linehan, who was in is a veterinarian, the first one to go to space. Don't know if he's the only one or not. But Marty, we love our astronauts from the shuttle era. They're doing great things out there in our communities. And uh, uh, I'm sure he's one of them. Well, as we look at the beautiful Milky Way here, we're gonna talk about three stars. And one's embedded above my head. That is Vega, the brightest one. And then up the, up the, uh, the upper right is Deneb. And then Altair is at the bottom there. And they form what's called the Summer Triangle. And the Milky Way cuts right in the middle of them. So not only can you see the Summer Triangle uh, this week, you can see it from your backyard any week, even when the moon's out. That's why we're talking backyard astronomy. But get out and see the Milky Way this weekend, like I said, because you can get a good photo of it and see 
the beauty of the Milky Way. But we're talking about these three stars that directly overhead. Oh, there's my, well, I'll make it like this. So you can see Vega, uh, the Neb there. Uh, the Neb, Vega, and Altar, all right? Vega is the one that's most directly overhead. And, it, and then uh, to the north is going to be Deneb, and to the south is Altair. This is not a constellation. It's what we call an asterism. And, and, and can you think of another asterism, Marty, that uh, is a star pattern that's not the full constellation? This is three constellations making up the Summer Triangle. But Marty, there's a real famous asterism I'm sure you know. The mo one Outside of the Orion... Orion, this is the most famous star group in the north. Oh, uh, and you get some starts with a P. You get some soup out of a, a Big Dipper. The Big Dipper. All right. Trying to cajole Marty into talking there in the microphone. But yeah, the Big Dipper is an asterism. It's just the hindquarters of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And there's other asterisms out there. But directly overhead from your backyard, you can see Vega. And to the north, Deneb. And to the south, Altair. And they connect in a beautiful triangle. And here again is an emphasis of that triangle there. Uh, behind you there. Now, there are three different constellations. You can see Cygnus is a cross constellation but actually it is a swan cygnus is the swan and you see deneb in arabic means tail all right we're also going to look at the beak the beak is called alberio and you're gonna and alberio is a very beautiful star but so alberio is the foot of the base of the cross it looks like a cross that is also called an asterism. The Northern Cross is the name for it. And from your backyard looking up, you can see the cross out of the Cygnus the Swan. But if Deneb's the tail, the hail is at the foot of the cross and it's swim, uh, swimming down the Milky Way. Now, Lyra is a parallelogram. Its constellation that Vega is in is a parallelogram called Lyra. And that's the old stringed instrument of old all right not a liar but a lyra and uh that because it kind of looks like a parallelogram reminded them of the lyra string instrument of old and then altair is the uh aquila the eagle so we celebrate the birthday of a veterinarian today and we've got two fowl a, a swan and an eagle in the sky to talk about on stay curious star curious today well, these three stars, and like I said, every star has a story about its size, its shape, and its distance. And these are the three stars we're talking about. Deneb at the bottom is a gigantic white dwarf. This is a scale model, folks, of how big Deneb is compared to Altair, Vega, and our sun. Altair and Vega are both about twice the size of our sun. But Deneb is over a hundred times bigger than our sun. In fact, they put the scale of the sun right there in a different scale to show you uh, that it, it even outdwarfs Vega and Deneb there. So this is important when we talk about Deneb because not only is it far, far away, but it is so bright that it is a behemoth of energy shooting out a, a lot of, of, of energy uh, to be so bright at the tremendous distance it is. And here is a artist's rendering of what Deneb might look like. Okay. And uh, 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 I could have, and we're going to start seeing the surfaces of nearby stars with the Webb telescope. All right. Can't wait to see that because we might see solar prominences or the flames of the of the uh, atomic reaction going on there, coming off the sun. We might see star spots, like our sun spots on the sun. So who knows what we're going to see. But there is the Cygnus the Swan, or the Northern Cross, and you have Deneb at the end there. Deneb is 1,800 light years away, a blue-white supergiant at magnitude 1. We call that first magnitude. Magnitude is an algorithmic arbitrary scale that's set in algorithms. So 
first magnitude star is 2.5 times brighter than the second magnitude star, which is 2. Point times brighter than the third magnitude star. All right, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is an algorithm worked out by astronomers a long time ago, a couple hundred years ago. And they're using their eyesight to judge uh, this, but then they later use what's called a photometer to get accurate measurements of the star's exact brightness as seen from Earth. But if the Neb is 1,800 light years away, what was going on 1,800 years ago, Marty? You don't remember? I wasn't there. <laughs> he said he... You you sure you you sure you weren't there, Marty, 1,800 years ago? Close, but no, I was not there. Well, that would be AD, AD 2022, and I looked it up. And uh, Pope uh, Calaxtus the first was killed by a mob in Rome's uh, Trastevere Center after a five-year reign in which he uh, he made Saturdays he made people fast three times a year with no food, oil, or wine to be consumed on those days. That was unpopular. So they killed this pope in, tw in uh, 2022. No, 222, 222 AD. And he was succeeded by Cardinal Urban I. And then Emperor of uh, uh, um, Rome called, you never heard of this guy, Elag Elagabalus, Elagabalus. Emperor Elagabalus was assassinated along with his mother, Julia Sominus, by the Praetorian Guard during the revolt. All right. They were not nice to them. They dragged their bodies through the streets of Rome before throwing them in the Tiber River. Whew. Those people were mean back then. And I did write down who was the new uh, emperor, but I forgot to write it down. It's uh, uh, Servius. Yeah. Alexander Servius was the new Roman emperor. Uh, 1,800 years ago, Marty, when light left this star and tonight it hits your eyes. Interesting thing about starlight, folks, light has two properties. It acts like a, a particle, like ping pong balls bouncing off the walls. That's how we have light here in our, our uh, Hyatt Place studios for Stay Curious. So it acts like a particle, bounces off of things, but it also acts like a wavelength. That's where we get the color, like a radio wavelength. The longer wavelengths are red. Shorter wavelengths are, are more excited at blue or white. So when you're looking at the light that left the Neb 1,800 years ago, it is literally hitting your eye and bouncing off, and starlight is entering your body in a very physical way. Think about that and stay curious. Stay star curious. Well, the next, I wanted to show you that at the tip of the, or foot of the cross, or tip of the nose of Cygnus the Swan, is Alberio. And Alberio translates in Arabic to beak. This star is 390 light years away. All right, very close, 390 years ago, light left it. And when you look at it through a telescope, it's a double star, as are almost half of the stars you see in the sky actually have another star relative going around it or more. Uh, our sun being a solo star is sort of uh, uh, an oddball. Over two-thirds of the stars in the sky have multiple star systems. We don't know what's up with that. But when you look at Alberio, you don't see one star this third magnitude. You see his fifth magnitude partner there that looks blue. And when you look at this, you can see it in binoculars or a small telescope at low power. And you see the distinctive gold and blue colors there. Like this is photographed through a telescope. And it's, the, it's one of the, the, the most beautiful color contrasts that you can see with your naked eye in the sky. Because it's bright enough to register colors. You see a red star, you know that star is kind of cool, as opposed to a hot white star. So, Alberio. Well, let's get back to the summer triangle there of, of Deneb. We're going to go to Vega next. And Vega, there you go. And, of course, uh, Altair is over at my arm here. And, like we said, Vega has a parallelogram. Uh, constellation Lyra that it's part of, all right? And you see that it is distinctively a parallelogram, 
And we're going to look at uh, the one side of that parallelogram here in a minute, the closest one to me, because there's a, a beautiful nebula there. But let's talk about Vega. Vega is one of our sun's close neighbors. It is only 26 light years away, which means the light that left there left in, in 1996. Hey, that's my daughter's age. Hello, Jessica. She was born in 1996. And uh, so the light that we're receiving in your eyes tonight in your backyard from Vega is 26 years ago it took to travel. How far away is 26? Uh, that's about a thousand trillion uh, miles. All right. Um, and, uh, but it's a close star. Nine, uh, uh, a light year is about nine trillion light uh, miles away. All right. Uh, I mean, six trillion. Uh, so six trillion times 26 is how many trillion light years away Vega is. Miles, I mean. Uh, Vega uh, is one of the closest. Um, it's 40 times brighter than our sun. All right. It's twice the size and mass of our sun. That's why it's so bright in our sky. And Vega has been extensively studied uh, by astronomers. Uh, and here's an artist's rendering of it because we know that it is not a complete sphere. It's probably oblate because it has a tremendous fast rotation. Not as fast as Altair that we're going to talk about here, but it's spinning around uh, quite fast, and so it's probably bulged in the middle, like Jupiter is. Um, it's twice the size and mass of the sun, one of the most important stars, arguably the most important star in the sky after the sun, because it was the first star photographed, the first star that a spectrum was done on. Uh, and it uh, it functioned as the baseline for calibrating calibrating the the photometric brightness scale of magnitude. And though only one tenth the age of our sun, since it's twice as big, it's in the middle of its lifetime. And in fact, it's going to blow up and die long before the Earth, uh, before our 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 sun does. Our sun is about 4 billion years old, billion with a B. We think it'll last about 8 billion when the atomic reaction will create an explosion that will be a supernova. And this will definitely turn into a supernova because it's so big. But Vega is 26 light years away. Now, I told you that Deneb was 18,000 light years away. All right. Marty, if we switch Vega with Deneb in the night sky... The Neb, if it was 26 light years away instead of 1800, it would cast a shadow in the daytime, be visible in the daytime, and at nighttime you'd be able to see and maybe read a newspaper uh, or magazine uh, like under a street light uh, if we switch to Neb and, and Vega. This is a real coincidence that the, that the closest star is only four light years away and not a very a bright star at that, Proxima Centauri. So, you see what I mean? When stars are not all alike in shape, size, and distance, uh, they have a lot of different meaning. And there's a concept of Vega. Now, an interesting idea about Vega concept is, it was once our North Star. It occupied the area where Polaris is. So, Marty, at the very top, you see the 2000 on the circle. That's Polaris. If you could circle that or point that out, my friend. And then this rotates around. There's Polaris, the North Star. You see it is the handle, last star, the handle, the little dipper that curves away to the right there. And this is called the precession of the equinoxes because the Earth, as it is spinning, rotating around spinning, we're, we're, it's actually cocked at, of course, 24 and a half degrees. That's what gives us a season. And it's kind of wobbling like a top that's about to give out its energy. You all know what a toy top is, right? A spinning little thing that, that spins and then falls down. Or a dreidel is another type of top in Jewish uh, toy room, all right? But it actually kind of is sloppy as it spins. So it makes an arc in the sky that every 26,000 years, it goes completely around once. 26,000 years is nothing when you talk about the Earth being 4 billion years old with a B. 
All right, 26,000 years into a million. Well, 26,000, five times 100,000. So about 25 times in a million years does, does we change pole stars. And look at the bottom is Vega there. In 1400 AD, all right, Vega will be the pole star again. And uh, I find that interesting that, that the pole... Uh, it was the pole star in 12,000 B.C., and it'll be the pole star again in 13,700 for another few hundred years. So this actually moves around where there's not a bright star near where the Earth's axis points in our spin where everything goes around. There's not a bright star at the South Pole. Uh, uh, right Cliff Watson down there in Pomona, Australia, they do not have a bright star around their South Pole. Octanes, octans, uh, which is a navigational instrument, is the constellation that the pole is in there. And they use a series of three or four that aren't so bright stars to align where the South Pole is. So, so uh, uh, Vega is a very important star. Could you imagine bright Vega being the pole star uh, in uh, 12,000 B.C., okay, 1,200 centuries ago. Boy, what was going on in 12,000 B.C., Marty? Not much, uh, since uh, we're sure that, well, the first maybe cave drawings were going on and that kind of stuff. But here's enough more about Vega. It takes 12 hours to go around once, all right? It, it, like I said, it's twice the size of our sun. That is very fast. would we'll create a big bulge there. All right. So we're going to learn more about these close stars like Vega and the next one, Altair, from the Webb telescope. We've been looking at them with the Hubble telescope, but it's not quite powerful enough to see the surface. It can discern the disk of them. And so let's, there's our summer triangle again, Deneb, Vega, and Altair. No, that's our... Uh, we don't have altars at the bottom. There's. We want to talk a moment about Vega being at the tip of Lyra the harp. Looks like a parallelogram. M57 is one of the more famous deep sky objects, part of the Messier list of faint fuzzies is what we astronomers call them because in your telescope, they just look like a faint fuzzy. But there's over 100 objects that Charles Messier, a French astronomer in the 1800s, categorized because he was looking for comets that looked fuzzy but they had a tail and they moved and uh, you could become famous by finding comets which they didn't understand what they were they knew they were cosmic intruders they had no idea that they were basically gigantic snowballs a drift of, of, of ice and rock uh, that come from the remains of the solar system that's way out past Pluto but M57 is a beautiful object to see, and in a telescope, it looks like a tiny little ring, like a smoke ring. So we're not supposed to talk about smoking. Let me have a, a little bit of rocket fuel to that. And see those two stars, one above my head right there, and the other one down there above Stay Curious? That's the stars of the parallelogram right there that it's easy to find M57 or the ring nebula. And though it looks like a ring, Marty, it is really more like a toilet paper tube or, or cardboard tube that we're looking at from end to end. It actually has a structure that's more rectangular when, if you see it from the side, which we never have, but we conjecture that by analysis from a great photo like this taken by the Hubble telescope. And there you see in the center, that faint star, you're right, that's the remains of the star. Then in sense, burped off its outer shell of gas and maybe had another explosion. And the faster explosion caught up with the slower burp. And that's where you see the interaction of all this gases and so forth being illuminated. And here's another interesting photograph of the dumbbell not the dumbbell the ring nebula <coughs> showing you what you can't see in visual but with x-ray and infrared photography it looks completely different and there's a lot of energy being dispelled outside the ring that we see 
All right. The last star of our triple header here is Altair. In uh, in Aquila the Eagle, Altair is also the name on uh, uh, Forbidden Planet of the of Anne Francis on uh, the uh, where the uh, that great science fiction movie with Leslie Nielsen in it. Okay, uh, Forbidden Planet when they land on they they land on a planet called Altair and she's named Altair, but Aquila the Eagle. Uh, looks like a again a mini cross, okay, like the Cygnus the Swan, uh, and it's deep in the heart of the Milky Way, not in the heart of in the ring of it. It's a blue white star, uh, and Altar is the brightest star of Aquila. It is the twelfth brightest star in the sky, an A type of white star, very bright. All right, so it's very close. Again, Altar is sixteen light years away, the closest of these three stars. Uh, and uh, so if it was where Deneb is, it'd be a very faint star. But it's about 100 trillion miles away from us, 16 light years. So the light that we're looking at of this left in 2006. And Altar is famous for its extreme rapid rotation, which makes its equator uh, go a complete rotation in just six hours. All right. And here's a concept of what that looks like. Though we're gonna start getting pictures of the surface of Altair just like we are of, of Vega. Uh, our sun requires 25 days to rotate once, all right? This star that is a little bigger than our sun, its rotation rate is six hours. So we think it's probably pretty egg-shaped like this, this uh, shows it here. Uh, but we know it's oblate. Its equator diameter is at least 14% greater than its polar diameter, Marty. So we've got, again, you're going to remember the Neb, Altair, and Vega. All right. Great names for your pet. All right. And uh, we're glad that William Whiting's watching us here. Doug Forrest. Hey, Doug. Thank you for uh, your wonderful picture that you contributed to our uh, uh, we're going to put it in one of our, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Auction. Yeah, uh, not auction. We're going to put it in the uh, gift uh, at the uh, masquerade ball. <clears throat> but we've got the Doug Force. Excellent. We had Doug on the, the program a couple of weeks ago, a great pen and, and uh, ink, uh, not pen and ink, but pencil drawer, Chris Kelly. Hello to you, another outstanding photographer, artist, and friend of our museum. Uh, thank you, Chris, for all that you're doing by letting us show, share your father's images and your images on T-shirts. Mark Usiak's watching. He was full of hot air over the weekend, Marty. He was at a balloon festival in uh, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Carlton Bailey's all stretched out with his pussy cats there at his home in Coco. Dave Stangy's watching. Ben Husett, Tom Usiak. Hope you're feeling well, my friend. Keith Sewell, thank you. Keith already signed up and paid for the Base for Space. He'll be there Sundays at the documentary at the Hyatt Place. Thank you, Keith. Uh, we got Cody Bailey uh, and Joshua Ramey uh, from Portsmouth, Ohio. My sister was born in Portsmouth, Ohio. That's got a cool little bridge, Marty, over the Ohio River there in Portsmouth, just on the other side of Kentucky. Carlos Hernandez is watching. Not sure if that's the astronaut or not. If it is, let's get you on Stay Curious, Carlos. And William Whiting and Robert Law is kicking off the week of Stay Curious in Dundee, Scotland, in front of his gigantic TV watching Stay Curious on YouTube, like we hope all of you are. Well, keep in mind, again, these three stars and all stars in the sky are different, all right? Somebody once said to me, Mark, you've seen one star, you've seen them all. No, you haven't, okay? That's why we want you to stay curious and learn about some of these stars, that they're all different. They're like people. Uh, they're different shapes and sizes and, and brightness and temperatures and individual worlds of their own. And Marty, you know something about even from your own backyard, all those stars you see from your backyard. When you're looking at those stars, I want you to think about one thing, folks. We think that every star has planets orbiting it, all right? 
all the closest stars have got planets. All these planets, these stars have got some planets going around. I failed to mention that. We know that Altair does and Deneb. I don't know if they found any around Vega. But um, most of the stars you see in the sky have, have, have not just one, but five or six planets going around them. So when you see all the stars in the sky out the Milky Way at your favorite camping place or beach or remote site on a mountain or out in the fields uh, in a dark area away from city lights, when you see all those stars, just think about there's a lot more planets out there that are looking back at us, maybe with intelligent creatures on it. So that's why I say we are not alone. If you think we're alone, huh, forget it. You're too egocentric, I think, because the, the universe is filled with life. And why not? Because everywhere we look on Earth, there's all kinds of life. So, well, I thank everybody for staying curious today. We thank the Hyatt Place Hotel for sponsoring Stay Curious and letting us use their facility again for a wonderful event this Sunday, the Base to Space. I'll be pinning this on top of our Facebook channel uh, page or go to Facebook and go to events uh, and you know the ticket portal's right there where you can sign up. So, Marty, anything else we need? Uh, Doug Forrest just texted or commented that he'll be at the event Sunday Doug Forrest coming to the event Sunday. All right, yeah. buddy. Yeah, and Joshua Ramey said he saw you back in April here at the museum. Joshua Ramey. Okay. Now, I do remember. Thank you, Joshua, for visiting us in April. And uh, uh, we're glad for all the shout-outs from everybody. we got a lot of mojo going on here at the American Space Museum from the programs that we're trying to make annual events, uh, like our Shuttle Fest. We're scheduling that in April. We've got a memorabilia uh, show November 5th at the Holiday Inn. We're going to start talking about, we've got our Masquerade Ball, Cosmic Masquerade Ball, October 22nd at the Beachside Hotel. Tickets will go on sale later this week for that fundraiser, $125 ticket event, but you're going to have a lot of fun and help our museum in the base to space this Sunday. So, Marty, thank you. I particularly thank my executive director, Karen Conklin, for all that she does behind the scenes to keep our wonderful museum afloat and allow and stay curious to thrive in this kind of an environment. So until tomorrow, we've got a special program with the 90-year-old mother and two daughters of the famous Ramones restaurant at Cape Canaveral. I mean, Cocoa Beach is where Ramones was. And we're going to talk about their famous Caesar salads and go back in a time machine uh, with the Ramon family that had one of the real iconic restaurants of the Space Coast in the 60s and 70s. So until tomorrow, I can't wait to see you again. I'm Mark Marquette. Please visit our museum soon and stay curious to bridge the space between us.